Um, right, thanks for coming along this afternoon. My name is Marcus Manafo. I work in the School of Experimental Psychology here at the University of Bristol. Um, Susie and I are going to talk about tobacco and cannabis, the lesser of two evils or just two evils. And this is very much a work in progress. Unlike some of the other talks, we're not going to be talking so much about um, things that we found out already, because the data that we've been collecting on tobacco and cannabis use on mental health problems um, have only really started to become informative because these are um, behaviours that emerge during adolescence and into early adulthood. And so the children of the 90s study is still very much at the point where that, that it's becoming informative about these kinds of issues. So we'll talk about what we are going to be doing more than what we have been doing, if you like. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. We've got about 15 minutes worth of material, um, maybe slightly more than that, but then there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions as well. But if there's anything that we talk about uh, that isn't clear as we go along, then just, just stop us. So these are some of the questions that um, we asked um, you uh, as part of the Children of the 90s study. You, you will be familiar with um, the questionnaires that have asked about all sorts of different things, including... Uh, the use of tobacco and other substances, have you ever smoked a cigarette, how many cigarettes do you smoke, uh, have you ever smoked cannabis, that kind of thing. And obviously this information is, is part of what then becomes informative with respect to the relationship between tobacco use, cannabis use, other substances and uh, potential um, problem outcomes, health outcomes, including both physical health but also mental health. So tobacco is... Obviously a known problem. We have known for a certain, for, for about six decades that, uh, that it's an unhealthy behavior. On the top left you can see um, tobacco plants. Uh, most of the um, tobacco that's grown, that uh, eventually finds its way into cigarettes, is grown in, in, um, in North America, but there are also um, quite large tobacco industries in Southeast Asia and Africa. Relatively little um, in Europe itself, although many of the companies are based in uh, Europe. Bottom left, we can see tobacco being used in its historical form, if you like. Tobacco use has been um, around in human societies for about 3,000 years, originally in North and South America, where it was used for ritual purposes, ceremonial purposes. It wasn't really used recreationally in the same way that tobacco is used today. And even back in the 1600s, there were concerns around the health effects of um, tobacco. This is a counterblast to tobacco, which um, rails against the... Uh, consequences of tobacco use in terms of the, the resulting ill health and so on. But tobacco use as we understand it, which is to say cigarette use, because the vast majority of tobacco used um, in uh, modern society is through cigarettes, really only came about in the late 1800s where manufactured cigarettes um, became popular. And it was during the First World War that we saw a really dramatic increase in the prevalence of tobacco use when cigarettes were included in, for example, the ration packs of soldiers. There are a couple of things that are worth mentioning about tobacco as smoked in cigarettes. The acidity of the tobacco that's cured to go into cigarettes is different from the acidity of tobacco that's used in cigars and in pipes, which means that you have to inhale it into your lungs to get the psychoactive effects, to feel the buzz that you get from smoking. Whereas with cigars and pipes, you can just inhale the smoke into your mouth and it'll be absorbed that way. That doesn't happen with cigarette smoke, as some of you might know. One of the consequences of that is that it becomes a lot more addictive because anything that you inhale into the lungs gets transferred to the brain very, very quickly. So the nicotine that is delivered to the brain from a puff on a cigarette reaches the brain faster than the heroin that you inject if you're an injecting heroin user. So the speed of delivery when tobacco is used in the form of a cigarette is part of what makes it particularly addictive. On the left-hand side here, you can see some of the advertisements for cigarettes that were around in the uh, 1940s, 1950s. The top left one is, uh, is one of my favorites, where um, this sad-looking little character is saying, before you scold me, Mum, maybe you'd better light up a Marlboro. So it's basically saying, if you don't smoke, you're going to be mean to your kids. Um, here at the bottom, we have a doctor endorsing cigarettes, saying more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarettes. These sorts of adverts were quite common, and actually, looking back at them now, we can see how far we've come. In the 1950s, there was the Surgeon General's report that was published in the US um, that came shortly after uh, the seminal work by Doll and Pito in Oxford showing an association between smoking and lung cancer. And so now we have these health warnings. Uh, the one on the top right is a European health warning. The one on the bottom right is uh, one that uh, 
is being proposed to be introduced in America. But we know that um, tobacco is harmful, and we've known that for uh, at least six decades in terms of very strong, clear epidemiological evidence that uh, it's related to a range of um, health outcomes. But there are still things that we don't know. And those include why people start smoking and also um, why it is that some people find it much easier to quit smoking than others, and also what other outcomes smoking might be associated with. So, for example, we know a lot about the physical health consequences of smoking, but we don't know so much about the mental health consequences of smoking. And that is particularly important in the context of what Susie's going to be talking about when she talks about cannabis. One of the pieces of information that we're using in the Children of the 90s study is genetic information. You may have been at the genetics talk earlier today, and obviously the Children of the 90s has a wealth of biological information, including genetic information, genetic material that's been taken from blood samples. And so we can use this genetic information to find out what it is that's different about people that find it easier to quit compared to those that find it harder to quit, for example, or what it is about people that um, start smoking and progress very rapidly to become dependent on nicotine, on tobacco, versus those that progress much more slowly. So although we know a lot about the health consequences of smoking, there's still a lot that we don't know. Great, so hi, I'm Susie Gage, I'm a PhD student, and I'm going to go through now the same for cannabis that Marcus has just talked about for tobacco. So much like tobacco, cannabis has been used for thousands of years in ritual settings, it's been smoked in ritual settings, but it was also used medicinally, and indeed it, when it came over to, to the United Kingdom, it was used medicinally in what's called a tincture, so this is extract of cannabis dissolved in alcohol. And you might wonder why there's a picture of Queen Victoria up there, but Queen Victoria was a cannabis user. She didn't use to smoke it, but she was prescribed it for period pains and for um, childbirth pains. So it's how times have changed when our royalty used to use cannabis. Now, um, cannabis fell out of favor medicinally when the syringe was invented, as it can't be dissolved in water to be, or dissolved in saline to be injected, because it's too complex, much in the same way that you can't inject nicotine, because they're very complex. Um, and cannabis became illegal in the 1920s in this country. So what do we know about the health effects of cannabis? Well, we know that in an acute dose, so while you are intoxicated with cannabis, you can experience some symptoms that are similar to psychosis. So these can include anxiety, paranoia, and panic. But we also know that acutely, cannabis has some health benefit properties. So for example, as I mentioned, it can be used as um, a treatment for pain, for chronic pain, for cancer pain. And there's also some evidence that it can help with symptoms of spasticity that occur in multiple sclerosis. Now, as for the long-term effects of cannabis, these are a little less well known, but certainly in this country, it's very rare that people smoke cannabis without also smoking tobacco. So all of the harms that Marcus discussed for tobacco, these also apply if you smoke cannabis with tobacco. And there is a bit of evidence that it might be that if you smoke cannabis by itself, it's still harmful because you're still burning a substance and inhaling it. So when you do that, you do inhale carcinogens. So it's definitely not good for your lungs. There's also some evidence that cannabis might have a negative effect on your memory. And like tobacco, there are some addictive properties in cannabis. So one in 10 cannabis users are likely to become dependent on cannabis. However, just because when you are high on cannabis, you experience these psychotic symptoms, that's not the same as prolonged cannabis use leading to conditions such as schizophrenia. Having said that, there are associations between prolonged cannabis use, particularly very heavy use, and psychosis or schizophrenia. However, correlation is not the same as causation, as I think has probably been discussed in previous talks today. If you see that some things are associated, it might be for another reason. So people who smoke cannabis might be a certain type of person, and that certain type of person might also be more prone to psychosis, rather than the cannabis itself causing the psychosis. Um, cannabis and depression, This poster here is suggesting that cannabis could actually help with depression. But again, cannabis and depression are associated. But is it the case that using cannabis 
causes you to become more depressed, or is it what's called reverse causation, whereby people who are depressed find that smoking cannabis alleviates some of the symptoms of their depression, so the association is seen because they are self-medicating. Also, I've put a picture of Sativex, which is a spray that um, basically contains almost all the same active ingredients as cannabis. So the main active ingredients are called THC, and cannabidiol, and this spray contains both of them. And it's being marketed as a treatment for um, yeah, the spasticity problems in multiple sclerosis that I mentioned earlier. But at the moment, there's still some sort of wrangling as to whether it's allowed to be used in this country because of the legal status of cannabis. So I'll hand back. So as Susie alluded to, one of the problems in this kind of research is disentangling what is really related to what and what the direction of that relationship is. So this figure on the right illustrates that, that you can have an exposure like smoking and a disease like depression, say, and it could be that the depression is causing people to smoke, it could be that the smoking is causing people to become depressed, it could be a bit of both of those, or it could be that there's some third, what we call confounding factor that we may or may not have measured um, and even if, we, even if we have measured it, we may not have measured perfectly, which is independently causing both of these so that there's actually no direct relationship between the two of them. And disentangling those two things can be very difficult. So, for example, we know that people who smoke tend to drink. We also know that smoking behavior is very heavily um, what we call uh, socially patterned. So we can see here, it's a bit, so it might be a bit small if you're at the back, but basically um, down here we have year going from 1992 to 2010, and um, we have the proportion that smoke by occupational status. So the dark lines are those who are in manual jobs and the green lines are, in the, are those who are in non-manual jobs. And you can see two things. First of all, people who tend to be in lower income employment are much more likely to smoke. And secondly, while there's been a strong decline in smoking amongst people in higher income occupations, there's been much less of a decline in smoking amongst those in lower income occupations. So actually now, the rate of smoking in the population as a whole is about 20%, um, but nearly all of that decline from a figure of 50 or 60% in the 1950s has come from people in um, more affluent positions in society, so that the rate of smoking in people who are in more disadvantaged positions is still about 50% in this country. So people from poorer backgrounds are much more likely to smoke, and what that does is increase um, health disparities between the well-off and the not so well-off. So if we come back to children of the 90s, you may wonder why we ask you about so many different things all across from pretty much everything that you could imagine being asked about, we may well have asked you. And that's because of this problem of confounding. So the people who smoke tobacco, as Marcus just said, are different from the people who don't smoke tobacco. And the same is true for the people who use cannabis. And if you want to look at the differences between these groups, in an ideal world, you take a random sample of people and get half of them to smoke cannabis and half of them to not. But there are obviously many reasons why we're not doing that. So all what we have is great data sets like children of the 90s. So some of the things that could confound the relationship between cannabis and, for example, mental health outcomes could be what happened to you during your childhood, whether you smoke cigarettes, whether you use alcohol, what your friends do, and whether you take other illegal drugs. So that's why we ask you all these kinds of questions in children of the 90s. So to finish off, we'll just go through some questions and what's known about them in relation to tobacco and cannabis and what we're currently looking at. So do you want to talk about tobacco? So one of the things that we've tried to emphasize is that this is really an ongoing project, that there are still lots of things that we don't know, and the Children of the 90s study is going to help us answer some of those questions. So in the case of tobacco, we do know that um, it's harmful to physical health. We've got very good evidence for that in relation to heart disease, a variety of different cancers, and so on. But we still don't know whether or not it's harmful to mental health. And so you can see here that uh, this little Children of the 90s logo indicates that we're, we've got ongoing research looking at the relationship between tobacco use and a range of mental health outcomes. In the case of tobacco, we know that it's harmful to other. We know that um, secondhand smoke exposure, passive smoking is harmful. It's very widely used, and we have to bear that in mind when we think about the public health burden of these behaviors, that tobacco use is not only harmful to the individual, but also harmful to um, society at large by virtue of the fact that so many people use tobacco. And then there's this question, which is a little bit sensitive, if you like, given that tobacco has been generally regarded as very harmful, which is that does 
tobacco potentially have some benefits, or at least do constituent parts of tobacco have some potential benefits, so that if we can learn about that, we can then extract those components and give them in isolation so that you don't have all of the other harmful stuff in tobacco coming along with that. You can just isolate the beneficial effects. And as you can see, in terms of cannabis, the picture is a little bit different in that we know much less about the, whether cannabis is harmful to physical health. There is some suggestion that it is, but as far as I'm aware, certainly there's not as much, by anywhere near as much evidence as there is for tobacco. Also, if you're looking at cannabis use in this country and talking about physical health, it's very hard to tease apart cannabis use from the tobacco that people smoke with the cannabis. Harmful to mental health, well, as I sort of alluded to earlier, there are certainly been a lot of media reports that cannabis might potentially cause schizophrenia or cause psychosis. Now, I would never say that cannabis causes schizophrenia or psychosis because I'm a very careful person who uses observational data, so I don't like to talk about cause. But certainly there is evidence that cannabis and psychosis are associated. But then we have to look at all these confounders that I discussed earlier, and that's what we're doing with children of the 90s. With all this rich data, we've got lots of information on confounders, so we can try and see whether this relationship remains, even if we really carefully take into account all of these potential other impacts on the relationship. So again, is cannabis harmful to others? We have this difficult difficulty where cannabis and tobacco are often used together, and I don't think it's been looked at anywhere near as much as tobacco has. Is cannabis widely used? Well, I think we can say yes, it is. And does it have potential benefits? Well, yes, it does, and that's what makes this whole issue a little bit more tricky. But um, thank you very, very much for listening. <laughs>